It's a city stamped with a capital O and surrounded by Pinot Noir. A good place to sit and think, either miss the natural beauty of the Pacific Northwest or in a lab with a hundred leads stuck to your head. Because you see, somewhere here in Eugene, Oregon, sometime in the 1970s, Michael Posner had a thought, and then he tried to measure it. Posner spent much of his childhood skipping around the West Coast with his father, a lawyer working for the USO in California during World War II. After the war, the family settled two states north, where Posner would later attend the University of Washington. I majored in physics in college. I wasn't very good at it, but it was extremely beautiful. While graduate school would see him trade physics for human psychology, the idea struck him that the mind, staggering in complexity, could be broken down, measured. Posner wondered, was it possible to measure thought? When Posner first started peering into the living human mind, he did so with the technology of the 1970s. We had clocks. We could me measure things in millisecond accuracy. Posner began timing the thought processes of the mind. A research subject sat in front of a screen, fingers hovering over a set of buttons. The screen would light up with two symbols. In this case, two uppercase A's, and in another case, an uppercase and a lowercase A. Subjects would press one button or another, depending on whether the letters were the same or different. If one is uppercase, one is lowercase, you have to actually deal with the names. That extra time turned out to be about a tenth of a second. That one tenth of a second was common in virtually all test subjects, meaning Posner was looking at the processing speed of a specific mechanism related to language. In other words, the mechanics of thought. His insights began to pave the way for the new field of cognitive science. He was fast becoming one of the most cited scientists in the history of psychology. The next decade saw Posner push his reaction time studies to their limit, but he wanted to go further. He wanted to look at the neurobiology underlying the processes he had measured. By then, the technological revolution had met the 1980s, giving us Simon, the Rubik's Cube, and positron emission tomography, also known as a PET scan. Posner had a suspicion that PET should be able to image the biology underlying the thought processes he had timed. In a PET scan, a person is injected with a special tracer drug that's then carried through the bloodstream. Now, when we have a thought, blood flows to the area of the brain responsible. Posner could measure the time it took for tracer molecules in the blood to be detected by sensors placed over different regions of the brain. This allowed him to pinpoint where thoughts took place as well as their duration. Suddenly, scientists could see the human brain in action. Posner's first PET studies painted clearer pictures of how language functions in the brain than anything available at the time, and it had a side benefit for neurosurgery patients. The way that neurosurgeons worked on the language system, which involved threading a catheter up through the carotid artery, I mean, it was very invasive. Posner had eliminated this revolutionizing neurological diagnostics. Over the years, he made groundbreaking discoveries as he uncovered neural processes that previously had been hidden. His exploration of the nature of attention has helped broaden treatment options for disorders such as ADHD. I've always been interested in trying to ask fundamental questions. And of course, cognitive neuroscience has the human brain, which is complicated, not as complicated maybe as a whole natural world, but pretty complicated and gives us a chance to work on fundamental questions. However, it may be that Posner's most profound contribution is to knowledge itself. He's pulled another thread from the fabric of our planet's most confounding, unraveling mystery, the nature of us.